Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for our COVID-19 and pesticides, what providers need to know about disinfectants webinar. My name is Carmen Boone. I'm an education coordinator from Oregon Pacific Area Health Education Center, a hosted agency of Samaritan Lebanon Community Hospital. And today I'll be your host and moderator. Let's go over some housekeeping items. On your GoToWebinar control panel, you will notice that all microphones are muted. They will remain muted during this session. If you are experiencing audio difficulties, make sure your computer speaker volume is turned up or use the phone option to listen in. You can download a slides deck from the handouts option. If you have any trouble downloading the slides, send me an email and I'll be happy to email them to you. Please use the questions option to type any question or comment at any time during the presentation. However, questions will be answered at the end. If we run out of time, we would still answer your questions via email. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website. You can see it there on, our, on your screen. If you have any questions, please email me at the email shown on the screen, C-A-R-M-E-N, B as in boy, at somehealth.org. To obtain CME or CE credit for this activity, you must log into www.eeds.com and enter this activity code. Please write down the code for your records. And again, email me or contact me if you have any trouble. The presenters and the planners of this activity report that we have no conflicts of interest or relevant financial relationships with any commercial entities that might affect the contents of this presentation. This presentation is jointly provided by Samaritan Health Services and the Oregon Pacific Area Health Education Center. This webinar is presented by Amy Cross and Diana Sims. Amy Cross is project coordinator for the National Pesticide Information Center and works closely with state, tribal, federal, and other partners to deliver pesticide safety education nationwide. Diana Sims is the Pesticide Medical Education Director of PERC-MED. PERC-MED is a cooperative agreement between the US EPA, the University of California, Davis, and Oregon State University. Now, without further ado, I will leave you with Amy and Diana, and let's start the webinar. I'm just going to share my presentation. There we go. Um, so I'm going to be starting off the presentation today, which is um, a modification on a presentation that we saw the need for because there was so much confusion and disinformation going around, even about the most basic disinfectant information. So what we did is we put together this presentation today for providers to kind of highlight what some of those misconceptions might be for the general public. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, some of the more technical aspects that you may be interested in and also where to find more information. So we're going to talk a little bit about product types and what misinformation we saw we've seen about that topic, um, as well as why the term contact time is important when you're using a disinfectant or when an individual is using a disinfectant. We'll very briefly touch on EPA's list N, which is a list of disinfectants. 
And then we'll talk about some precautions. And I have a couple more less common topics I want to cover. Um, those are very specific, but I still think they're worth mentioning because they do come up, especially more and more as time goes on. Um, so then we're going to cover some of those healthcare provider reporting requirements by state. And, um, and then we'll talk about some of those resources that we have for both providers and for patients. So I think it's nice for me to introduce the organization I represent today. I'm with the National Pesticide Information Center, and I know a lot of you may not be familiar with our services already, but we are a primarily general public facing organization. So we're formed as a cooperative agreement between the US EPA and Oregon State University. And our objective, our main goal is to provide unbiased scientific information about pesticides so that we can promote informed decision making for others. So the idea is that we're really good at finding and talking about really technical information in a general way so that an individual can make a decision that's well informed regarding pesticides. And so why this makes sense for today's webinar is that disinfectants are classified as pesticides by the US EPA. Um, so if someone were to call in and have questions about disinfectants, we can talk about a whole host of things. We can talk about general health and safety, which could mean precautions around using a disinfectant. It could mean that they know an application is going to occur or possibly that a professional is going to be applying something or not themselves is going to be applying something. So what are those steps that they can take to reduce risk even when the application is out of their control? Uh, it's possible that there may have been an exposure and in a non-emergency situation, they can speak to us in general about questions they have for toxicology, or maybe they're actually wanting to go and pick out a product, but they just have no idea where to start. We're not gonna be recommending a product to them, but we will help them you know, use the tools that are available to make the selection that makes the most sense for them. Um, so I have to obviously include caveats here because our services are so wide. There's a lot of confusion about what we are and what we aren't. So I have to mention that we have no medical training. We are scientists and we are science communicators, but we can't give medical advice and we can't give legal or regulatory advice. We're kind of like a catch-all. And um, across the nation, we answer questions about hundreds of different topics about pesticides and, different, uh, and disinfectants. Um, so it's, it's really wide, but I have to mention those caveats as well. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Diana Sims to talk a little bit about Perk Med. Thanks, Amy. As um, Amy was giving the introduction about NPIC and what the organization is that she represents, just a brief overview. I am the medical education director for Perk Med, and our aim is to help healthcare providers prevent recognize and treat pesticide related um, illnesses and injuries. And that could be a wide variety of things through the provision of resources, technical assistance, training. And as Amy was describing just a moment ago, the kind of catch all, we wanna be able to point um, healthcare providers to the resources that are specific to the patient populations that they're serving um, and to develop collaborations to continue further uh, continuing medical education, continuing nursing education, clinical education um, for providers on this important topic. One small aspect of which we're covering here today about disinfectants. And next slide, please, Amy. Um, so in order to accomplish this, we have assembled a panel um, of an advisory board of experts, which um, includes representatives from rural health, from pediatrics, from toxicology, um, and from different nursing, such as public health nursing organizations as well. Um, one of the ways that we carry out our mission at PerkMed is to develop national partnerships with um, organizations that serve a wide variety of healthcare providers, um, such as working with the um, National Nurse-Led Care Consortium, as one example, the American Academy of Pediatrics, or the Pediatric Health um, Environmental Specialty Units. Um, so those are, experts that we rely on um, to help us gain the reach across the United States to share this important information about how ubiqu ubiquitous pesticide usage is and what the signs and symptoms are to be looking for as a healthcare provider. And additionally, we're available for, to provide kind of consulting, technical assistance as well when uh, these types of questions come up. 
So that's just a brief overview of what PerkMed does. And I'll turn it back to you, Amy. Thanks, Diana. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about product types. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about product types. Um, it, you know, in terms of you picking out a product or, or needing to give this information, but in terms of what we're seeing in terms of misinformation, because so there's some things that are just very simple to clear up. Um, so I think the biggest question, the most common question we get is, what is the difference between the different types of cleaner sanitizers or disinfectants that might be out there? So there's, there's a big difference between cleaners and other types of products. A cleaning product is one that is not actually making a claim to kill, reduce growth of, or in other ways, get rid of some kind of pathogen. So a cleaner is actually not going to be regulated by the US EPA in the same way as a disinfectant or a sanitizer. It's not gonna actually be considered a pesticide. So it kind of falls out. And in many ways, these are gonna be less regulated than the other products we're gonna talk about. And it can be hard for individuals to recognize when something is a cleaner and when it's not, except that sometimes the wording will say things like maybe it whitens, it cleans, it removes odors, it removes grimes, but it, it, it's not actually saying that it's going to kill viruses, kill bacteria, or reduce the number or the percent of those things. So a cleaner is going to be the weakest of all of the different product types that, that people will find out there on the market, but it may also be one of the most common. So if an individual is talking about a surface sanitizer, it's a stronger product than a cleaner, but a surface sanitizer as regulated by the US EPA as a pesticide is only going to be registered to reduce surface bacteria, not viruses. And that's very important because when we're talking about hand sanitizers, it can be confusing because sanitizers for surfaces and sanitizers as an antiseptic on the hands, that phrasing gets thrown around so much that there can be a lot of confusion. So disinfectants are going to be, of the three that we're talking about, the three categories, they're going to be the strongest of all of these. They're also regulated by the US EPA as pesticides, and disinfectants are specific to also being able to kill viruses on surfaces. So if we're talking about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we're talking about disinfectants, not surface sanitizers, and that's very important. And, and also what's very important about this is that these surface disinfectants are designed and tested for controlling very specific viruses and only those viruses that are listed on the label. What that means is that you can't just go to the store and pick up anything that says it's a disinfectant or anything that says it kills viruses. You actually need to turn over, flip open the booklet and look for the different viruses that are listed. You can imagine that for the general public not knowing this, that can be a huge point of confusion because Everything that's messaging right now is disinfectant, 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 but they're not all made the same. And we'll talk about how some of those, those changes, those differences are very important. Um, another thing I'd like to bring up here is that there are products out there that are combination sanitizers and disinfectants, and it depends on which of the instructions you watch or you actually follow. So if the instructions are talking about this cleaning method for this sanitizer product, um, but you want to control a virus, you change that method of control and you, and you use it this way. So there are combination products out there, but this can be incredibly confusing because sanitizers can have claims that are residual activity. So um, you can have a product that claims to be like a 24 hour sanitizer, and that same product may be a sanitizer disinfectant, but the residual claims do not apply for the disinfectant. And that's really frustrating because if you're seeing 24 hours sanitizing, disinfecting, you're assuming that that's a 24 hour either sanitizing or 24 hour disinfecting. And that's not necessarily true. Um, to my knowledge, currently available widely to the general public, at this point in time, there are not disinfectants that can be using those residual activity claims. There are exceptions to this rule, but they're not really available to the general public. They may be for very specific uses in hospitals, or there may be an exemption that has been granted to different airlines or to different facilities. So when we're, we're talking about the general public, at this point in time, the information is that there are no residual activity, long-lasting viral claims. 
for disinfectants. Okay, so here's another really common misconception that I already touched on. And that's the difference between these EPA registered pesticides as sanitizers and disinfectants and hand sanitizers. And I think that the language here is just unfortunately similar, but you know, one is actually regulated as a pesticide by the EPA only for use on surfaces and only for use on those surfaces that are listed on the label. So if it's a spray product, an individual may be interested in spraying it in the air or spraying it on fabrics. And it may not even be effective if those sites are not listed on the label. I can tell you right now that air is not a site that's going to be listed for use for these types of disinfectants. Now hand sanitizers, antiseptics, regulated by the FDA and can be used on people, obviously. That's just one of the biggest problems that we're having with that word sanitizer is that they hear people need to be using hand sanitizers and they think that that means a sanitizer, even if it's an EPA registered sanitizer, is good for use in the home on surfaces. But really to control the SARS-CoV-2 virus needs to be a disinfectant, not a sanitizer. Okay. So what is contact time? Contact time is potentially the most important piece of information on a disinfectant label. And I'll reiterate that. Contact time, if not followed appropriately, will render the use of that product completely useless. So contact time is the amount of time that a product must sit wet on top of a surface in order for that disinfectant to be effective. So this is something a lot of us are not used to looking for on the labels. We're thinking, you know, maybe spray wipe or spray and let it dry or something like that. But a contact time can vary. So one product can say, um, you know, it says kill SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it has to stay wet on that surface for two minutes. Whereas another product may say one minute. Another one might say four minutes. So you can imagine that if you are trying to clean an area using a disinfectant, that if you don't let it sit on that surface for a long enough amount of time, you're essentially introducing chemicals into your environment without use. So following the contact time is incredibly important. The other part that's confusing about this is that on the same product, on the same label, if you have a list of all of those viruses that this label this product is good for that will control or is expected to control. Each of those viruses on your one label can have different contact times. So you may have norovirus listed and then you may have SARS-CoV-2 listed and you might have something else listed and it's possible for those contact times to be different. So this, this again, this is one of those things that if, if you happen to, you know, talk to an individual um, and, and they mention that they're using these products, if they're not using them appropriately, if they're not letting that contact time you know, really sit there and dwell for long enough, what it can actually do is, is it can lead to uh, potential resistance on surfaces because you're not necessarily effectively killing that virus on those surfaces. Um, so contact time, very, very important. Uh, at this time, there are almost 80 products out there that list the SARS-CoV-2 virus on the label but there are over 500 on the list that the EPA has established for disinfectants that are basically expected to be effective against SARS-CoV-2. And so that's why we're gonna talk about list N and what that is. So list N is, it was created by EPA back in March of 2020 and it's a, semi-comprehensive list. It's not final and they're always adding to it, but it's, it's at this point in time, it has a lot of products. I think it has 517 products on it as of today and that number is always growing. And these products are expected to control the SARS-CoV-2 virus on surfaces. So um, this is important because there were, especially in the beginning, a lot of need for disinfectants, but the disinfectants had did not have SARS-CoV-2 virus on the label yet. And even to this day, there's still only about 80 that have actually gone through the registration process and have all the data that's required to get their product registered with SARS-CoV-2 on the label. So, so this list is actually very handy because it, it tells us what other things are also expected to control the virus. 
And this list isn't new and there's nothing, N doesn't actually stand for anything. It's actually just in sequence. So they have list A, B, C, D, et cetera, so forth. When there is a public health pathogen of importance for some reason that comes up suddenly, it's a new emerging pathogen in some way. Um, this is something EPA has done to try to be helpful. They've created this list of products based on the science that are expected to be able to control whatever that new pathogen is. So, so list N just happened to be the next one in, in, the, in the sequence. There are several criteria that they use in order to add a product to the list. Some of the criteria include, well, number one, those 80 some odd products I told you about that actually now have data to support that it does control SARS-CoV-2 virus on surfaces. That's number one. Uh, but in the beginning, there, there's a lot of products on there that kill um, harder to kill viruses. So if um, there's, there's different categories based on the makeup of the viruses about how hard, how difficult they are to, to kill. Um, and so if it is, there are categories harder to kill than SARS-CoV-2, if it's in that category, then that product will get added to the list. Also, if the product is already registered for use against other human coronaviruses, then it gets added to the list. So these are some of the reasons why a product would be on there, why there's over 500 products registered for SARS, not registered, but, but listed for SARS-CoV-2 and expected to be effective. Okay, so now we get into the common questions. Um, you may receive questions like this, you may not, but I think it's really important to know what all the possibilities are out there. For example, if an individual has a product already, and we know through product shortages that, that have been ebbing and flowing throughout the country, you know, sometimes somebody is lucky just to get their hands on anything. And they're wondering, okay, well, I have this product maybe already at home, or I was able to snag this at the store. Is this gonna work against SARS-CoV-2? The first thing that they can look for is to see whether it lists the word disinfectant or kills viruses on the label. Because we already talked about some of the language that might actually indicate that this is a cleaner, which would not be effective, or possibly a sanitizer, which would also not be effective against viruses. If disinfectant or kills viruses is listed on that label, another thing they can look for is if it has an EPA registration number. If it's a sanitizer or a disinfectant, it will have an EPA registration number. It's a unique number that's given to every pesticide product, including disinfectants. It's an identifier, and that's the same number cross country. That's really helpful for us when someone calls in with that number because then we have a way to look up the exact product that's in hand. So now, okay, I wanna know, I have a product that says it's a disinfectant, I found an EPA registration number, is it gonna be effective against SARS-CoV-2 virus on surfaces? The next step to look is to cross compare the list of EPA registration numbers that are on list N. So those are all listed there and you have a product, you found your EPA registration number. What you're actually going to be comparing is only the first two sets of numbers. The product may have up to three sets of numbers like you see in that second example, but that third set of numbers is it's just a distribution number. It's, it's irrelevant for this conversation. So we're focusing on the first two sets of numbers separated by dashes. If the product you have that you're reading off has that EPA registration number for the first two sets, and then you go to list N and you find the same first two sets, those products are equivalent. They, they, for all intents and purposes, for our conversation here, are, are the same, quote unquote. It basically means that there hasn't been, um, there hasn't been any change in the formulation, there hasn't been any change in the active ingredients or, or the percentage of the active ingredients in that product. Okay, so let's say you've gotten so far as to understand that yes, the, this product is on list N, but then you're looking at the instructions and you know how important the contact time is. How do we know which instructions to follow? So after you've matched the EPA registration number to the number on list N, there's a column on list N on the website that says follow disinfection directions for the following viruses. So for example, if the product that I found on list N says follow instructions for norovirus, 
then I would go to my label, look for norovirus, and those are the instructions that I would follow. Um, List N also does a really good job of actually saying what the contact time should be for the product that you have. So even if for some reason you're getting confused between like, okay, norovirus and going to the label, it says norovirus here, maybe you're confused about that and you wanna make sure the contact time is correct, the contact time is also listed on EPA's website on List N. So it's a really, um, it's an unusual way to answer that easy question, will my product work? Um, but this is something that we're getting questions about a lot at NPIC and, and so we're, we're helping individuals step through this process, which is one reason why a lot of providers are referring to our services, giving out our phone number just so that we can help an individual step through this process. Uh, so here's a more visual example of what that product EPA registration number will look like and it's highlighted in blue on the right hand side. I'm going to emphasize this one last time. The name of the product actually can change from state to state and from registration to registration. So what we really want to focus on is that EPA registration number. It's a unique identification code for that product. That's going to be the most useful piece of information aside from the instructions on the label. Okay, here's another um, question that we get often, which is that my product is not actually on list N. So what might I actually have if I don't have a product on list N? It's possible that it's not a disinfectant. The person may have a sanitizer or cleaner, which we already discussed. It's possible this product is effective against SARS-CoV-2 virus. Maybe it has human coronavirus listed on the label, but it hasn't been added to list N yet because that's something that the registrants are applying to EPA to get that. And it's a very quick process if it's already approved and registered and meets their criteria, um, they're, they're needing to reach out to EPA to get that added to the list. And maybe it is a disinfectant but it doesn't list human coronavirus on your label. And if it's not already on list N, what that might mean is that you may just not have enough information to answer that question. A lot of times we can help at the National Pesticide Information Center based on scientific studies for all the viruses that are on that label. So we might be able to dig into the science a little bit more and help an individual with that. Okay, so I'm not gonna step through the tool itself because you know, there's, there's a lot of products on there and I don't actually think it would be useful. It can be useful to see it and recognize it and to know that this is a very user-friendly interface, especially for the general public. So in this instance, I've just Googled list N and EPA's website popped up. Once I launched the tool, I have several different ways that I can search for a product. So like I said before, if I already have a product on hand and I want to search for the EPA registration number, I can type that in. Now, if I'm doing research, maybe I want to find a product that I don't have already. There's a couple different ways to do that based on, you know, is it going to be used in an institution like a school or a hospital setting, or is it going to be used at, at home? Do I want to only look for products that have a, a shorter contact time? That's a possibility. Um, or maybe I just want to browse through them. So in this example, I'm just going to say I only want to select certain active ingredients because this is a personal interest of mine in this scenario. So EPA has a short list of active ingredients that they are calling safer choice. Safer choice active ingredients are lower in toxicity than some of the other options out there. And so what I might do is select one of these active ingredients and then go back to the search tool on list N and type that into the active ingredient field. And it doesn't auto search for you. So you start typing the word and it pops up, which is very handy. So that way, you know, maybe you find a product and then you can go Google for it or you can call your local store and see if it's available. Okay, so this next section, I'd like to talk about some precautions for disinfectants and I don't wanna leave out disinfectant wipes. So talking about disinfectant wipes first, this is a really common um, uh -oh misconception is that children, keep out of reach of children is really referring to no one under the age of 18 should be using this product. Um, just because it's in a handy wipe form 
doesn't mean that it should be added to class lists for in-person school sessions. Children shouldn't be applying this to their own desks. Um, a lot of times, even though they're friendly and easy to use, they may have instructions that the surface has to be rinsed with potable water after use, or hands have to be washed after use. And that might actually be in the instructions, um, which is not just optional, but needs to be done to reduce risk. So I want to emphasize that Keep Out of Reach of Children includes these wipes products if it's a disinfectant and under 18 shouldn't be using it. Uh, these wipes are not intended for use on skin or body. If it says disinfectant, it's for use on surfaces only. And there are antiseptic wipes out there, which can be very confusing because the packaging looks very similar. But again, if you're seeing that EPA registration number listed, you know it's a registered pesticide through the EPA, and so it should only be used on surfaces. There are some of these wipes that can be used on food contact surfaces, but not all of them. So again, check the label, make sure that this is something that can be used either in the kitchen, on the countertops, or on anything that might contact food. And then a good practice is to wash hands after use every time. That's just going to reduce the amount of time that that is on your skin and can reduce risk of absorption. And I think this is one of the funniest parts about using a wipe is that a lot of us, I mean, myself included, before I knew this information, I want to use a wipe over as big of a surface as I can. But as I'm using that wipe, it's drying out over time. And so if it has a contact time of 30 seconds, it doesn't mean that you go over it for 30 seconds. It means that surface is wet with the substance for 30 seconds. So if you're using a, a wipe that's drying out over time and the surface doesn't remain wet for that contact time, you're not actually disinfecting that surface. And we've talked about how it's just introducing chemicals into the environment that aren't actually being effective. Okay. So home remedies was a big issue for us because there were so many product shortages, especially in the spring and summer of 2020. So we wanted to talk about some of the risks of home remedies so that an individual can make an informed decision um, depending on what they'd like to do at home. We don't recommend one thing or another, but we will talk about the potential risks. So never mix cleaning products, that's, that's an easy one. Um, I, I found this new visual that I wanna share with everyone, which is, is more than just the common mixing agents. You know, we, we've kind of all heard about don't mix ammonia and bleach, but here are some of the other ones that, you know, hydrogen peroxide and vinegar. That one was shocking to me because I've never heard don't mix that combination before. And I feel like I have lots of vinegar in the house for laundry and different reasons and hydrogen peroxide for injuries and things like that. And people love cleaning with those two solutions, but they shouldn't be mixed. Same with some of the others like bleach and rubbing alcohol. So I really liked that and wanted to share that today. Um, it's not my infographic, but I found that online. Okay, so one of the risks of home remedies is that there aren't going to be instructions about how much of the product to dilute or how much to use, how long the contact time should be, um, and, and with, even with a low toxicity product, this is what risk is, right? Even with a low toxicity product, if you have a high exposure to it, then you have a high risk scenario. Or the way in which you're exposed to it can represent a high risk scenario, like vinegar in the eyes, low toxicity orally, but can cause more eye damage depending on concentration and depending on how long before it's rinsed out. These labels are not going to have any kind of first aid instructions. They're also not going to give any guidance or requirements for protective clothing. And like I said, you know, maybe wearing eye goggles or some kind of eye shield is going to help if you're going to be using a lot of vinegar because the eyes can be more sensitive than the skin. Also, these home remedies are not tested for efficacy. In the amount you want to use, for the contact time you're guessing, and the dilution rate you've tried there isn't going to be efficacy for a lot of these home remedies. And we'll talk about bleach specifically next, but um, this is in general for most of these, these active ingredients that people are using at home or products that they're using at home. They're just, we don't know that they're actually working. Okay, so what about quote unquote regular bleach? This is a bleach product that is not called a disinfectant. There are bleach products out there that are registered as EPA disinfectants. 
So they will have an EPA registration number. They will have efficacy data required for their submission for registration. And um, you know, those disinfectants, when they're registered, they'll have all of the instructions there for the viruses or bacteria you're wanting to kill. So plain whitening bleach won't have any of that information. But the CDC has given some guidance about how to use and dilute regular bleach to control the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay, some of the precautions, or so some of the caveats here is that we won't have instructions unless you're going to the CDC's guidelines specifically. The labels themselves, the bottles, aren't going to have instructions or precautions necessarily. And the percent that you purchase in the store can vary. What I mean is that a bleach product might be 5% bleach dilution, or it could be 8% bleach dilution. And because of that small difference, and it could be even higher, um, there can be a big discrepancy between the instructions that you might be finding online and how much water you're supposed to add to dilute it. Um, so those, the lack of instructions there is potentially concerning. If these bleach products have scents added to them, or maybe it's a gel or something else added to them to make them friendlier, easier to use, spread better on surfaces, stick better to surfaces, all of those different additives affect not only the efficacy of the product, but also if you're using it in a place where it could come in contact with food surfaces like a countertop, it could impact the food safety element there. And then this is, this is kind of a point I bring up with anything that we've got around the house in general, because we're already familiar with this household bleach that we're using for laundry and other cleaning, um, we may have less vigilance and less care that we're taking in order to use the product, right? We're familiar with it, we know the product, we feel like we can use it, so we use it a lot and we don't take as many precautions because ventilation is incredibly important for bleach. Sodium hypochlorite is an asthmogen. So this is something where if an individual or a household is ramping up their use of this product at home and they're more familiar with it, so they're not necessarily taking as many precautions, they are increasing their risk in those situations. Um, whereas if it's a product that has instructions, they may be better able to see what they shouldn't be doing on that label. Okay, so here I'd like to talk about a disinfectant exposure scenario. This is just one example of ways that individuals are using disinfectants that end up increasing their risk potentially by a lot and these are not uses that are approved for these products. So for example, um, initially there was a large shortage of N95 respirators, and, and still there are shortages depending on where you are. So the intent of some of these individuals was uh, just to be able to reuse the same masks over time, but knowing that they had been either out in public or in a situation where they were interacting with an individual that had the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they're wanting to disinfect them. So they may take a surface disinfectant and spray it on the mask, and they may, they may let it dry between application and wearing it again, but there are a lot of problems with this use scenario. Even if it's dry, it can have an increased dermal risk if this is not something that's supposed to have prolonged contact on the skin, especially the sensitive skin of the face. Um, which can be more absorptive than some of the other parts of your skin. Also, there are increased inhalation risks. These active ingredients, even when they're dry, if they have a high enough vapor pressure, they're going to continue to transition from that surface into the air over time, creating fumes. And, and sodium hypochlorite bleach is a great example of this because it has a lower vapor pressure. And so even after it dries, whatever residues are on those surfaces can continue to come up and vaporize into the air over time. So then that represents an increased inhalation risk. So one of the reasons I bring this up is because I want to be clear that there aren't disinfectants available residentially for the general public or general use that they can use on an N95 respirator like this or on a homemade cloth face covering or a cloth mask that we might make ourselves or get from a friend. So those use sites have not only not been tested for efficacy, but we know that they haven't been tested for safety. 
So they're not going to appear on any of those residential products. Now, again, there are exceptions to this rule. There are some hospital settings where they can disinfect using certain products in certain ways. But in general, this is not accessible to the general public. This is not accessible to me or you for the most part. And so I think it's very important to understand that, that disinfectants cannot be applied to N95 respirators or cloth face coverings. I like to talk about the example of disinfectants in the kitchen or disinfectants in food um, because there has been some information out there about disinfecting the outside of food packaging after it comes home from the store and never use disinfectants directly on food or food packaging. This is something that FDA so far, all of the guidance that, that I've seen from them has said that this is not a, um, a large risk or a health risk to, to have. Now, of course, there's exceptions to every rule, but food is not the primary way that the virus is being transmitted. Fomite transmission is more, but food, food is less. Um, so never use it directly on food. But then also look at the label to see if it lists food contact surfaces. So food contact surface is anything that it's possible or reasonable that food might come into contact with it at some point. It may be that they want you to first pre-clean that surface with soap and water so that the disinfectant can be more effective. And then they may also want you on the label to do a post-application rinse with potable water, with drinkable water, so that you know residues are taken away after that contact after that contact time is over, you can take away residues using that potable water rinse. Okay, I have a couple less common topics to go over. One of them is to talk about foggers, misters, and electrostatic sprayers. These you may see mentioned in the news. There may also be some used in different facilities, um, but foggers, misters, and electrostatic sprayers are kind of an unusual situation. It's possible for a disinfectant to say that this application method is appropriate via mister, via electrostatic sprayer. That's definitely a possibility. However, if it's not specifically listed on the label for use in that application method, then what it means is that that method and its efficacy hasn't been tested and we just don't know that it's effective. Now, because of that, if the label doesn't list a fogger, a mister, or an electrostatic sprayer, any one of those, either in combination or separately, if it's not listing those on the label, EPA does not recommend its use for that disinfectant product. It may be that that disinfectant product was meant to be a spray on a surface and wipe off, or, or it might be something that was intended to be diluted in a bucket and use a sponge to clean with or, or a towel of some sort. Um, but, but this is something where we're thinking about ease of application. You know, it might be lower cost, it might be lower effort, it might be able to get into nooks and crannies better. But if it doesn't list that application method, we don't have efficacy data. Another less common, but actually more common everyday topic is something called devices. These are EPA regulated, but they're, they're not actually going to appear on list N. So a device is a machine or, or some kind of mechanical item that's going to, to get rid of a virus or bacteria or other pests. So, in, in this instance, an example might be a UV light or an ozone generator, um, or it could be an air purifier. So all of these different types of devices, this is an EPA regulated item. It's not an EPA registered item. It's not going to have that EPA registration number and none of them are going to appear on list N. And that's because devices, although they're required to back up any claims that they make, like, for example, if a UV light on the packaging says kills SARS-CoV-2 virus, and EPA goes to that company and wants to have that data, they need to be able to show that data. But up front, they're not required to give any efficacy or safety data before they sell the product. So that's very different from the pesticide or disinfectant product registration process. This is that they do have regulations, they are regulated. Um, but they're not reviewed ahead of time for safety and efficacy. It's a little bit of a buyer beware situation. Um, so I know that these can be really common in medical settings, especially for different hospitals and larger institutions. So just, just being aware of, of what they are and what they are not can be very helpful. 
Oh, another thing to mention about UV lights is that it's possible they may be regulated by the FDA as well, jointly as a medical device. And so that means that there would be a whole other list of regulations or requirements through the FDA that I'm not necessarily up on because we are sticking to the pesticide side of things. Okay, and so now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Diana. She's gonna go over some of those reporting requirements for healthcare providers, as well as go over some of those educational resources that are available through the Perk Med and, and, and PIC websites. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Um, so as Amy was giving us the context of all this detailed information about um, uh, the usage of, of pesticides in the COVID context, given these the challenge of helping to control um, SARS-CoV-2, there's been really an increasing demand um, for the use of antimicrobial pesticides um, to help slow down uh, the spread of it. And so since the emergence, there's been um, some manufacturers has actually reported, um, as probably some of you on the webinar may know, by trying to find products in your own towns and stores, one man manufacturer reported there was a 500% increase in demand for the antimicrobial wipes. Um, in a recent uh, MMWR, or Morbidity Mortality Weekly report, found that poison centers received an increase in the number of calls comparing the first three months of 2020 to the first three months, uh, January, February, March of 2019. And so there was an increase in the number of calls to poison centers across the country, um, specifically for exposures to different cleaners and disinfectants. And this was a considerable spike, especially in the child pediatric population of kids under age five. Um, so although this data that's reported in the um, morbidity mortality weekly report uh, doesn't provide a definite link between cleaning for COVID concerns. There's clearly a, a temporal association between the two. Um, so what I wanted to explain quickly uh, through this pesticide reporting requirement slide is that um, across the country, the, the requirements for healthcare providers on when and where and how and who to report a pesticide related illness or injury varies considerably. Um, so one thing that we've done at PerkMed is to assemble this map, which contains information that's up to date as of July 2020. There's an extensive quality assurance check that was done on the reporting requirements, uh, which is um, the legislative authority for which varies from state to state. So the map that you see in front of you right now um, depicts three different reporting categories across the country, being those states with mandatory reporting, those with optional reporting, and the lighter colored states where there's no specific reporting requirements. Currently, 64% of states in the United States and territories have mandatory reporting, 15% have optional reporting, and 21% have no specific requirement. Um, a further note, as I was saying earlier, there is such variation, and some states will require just that exposures or illnesses or injuries are just to be reported for occupational associated cases. So it depends on where you are. So what I want to do next, um, if you can have the next slide, please, Amy. is use the example here of Oregon, which I believe most of our participants today are from the, the, this particular Pacific Northwest region. If we look at Oregon as an example of a mandatory reporting state, when you click on that map that I just showed you on the Perk Med website, um, you can click on that and it will take you to a listing either alphabetically of the entire country or the individual state, which as we can see here from the example of Oregon, that, um, in Oregon, the mandated reporters are physicians, hospitals, laboratories, and other healthcare professionals. Uh, the time to report such a suspected or confirmed keywords there um, to report those are within 24 hours of a healthcare provider uh, becoming aware um, of that. And where they are to be reported to is to the Oregon Health Authority. There's a link, as you can see in the bottom right hand side, that links directly to the reporting website, and that's done through the cleverly named PEST program, or the Pesticide Exposure Safety and Tracking Program um, here in Oregon. And the phone numbers there um, listed are as well, of course. 
So the requirements can be found for each one of the states and territories across the United States on our website with the specific information about um, who, what, when, and where, and why to report. And next slide, please, Amy. So one of the key uh, pivotal resources uh, where healthcare providers can get more detailed information that's listed in this book is called the Recognition and Management of Pesticide Poisoning, the sixth edition. Um, and this provides consensus recommendations for treating patients with pesticide-related illnesses or injuries. And this has a lot of incredibly uh, deep, rich information that is driven by um, decades of clinical experience and is um, basically the manual for anything related to health effects of pesticide. So this is available for downloading on the website. If you uh, are interested in receiving a hard copy, um, you can um, order that online, or you can also feel free to reach out to me directly, and I can try to facilitate that process if you're interested in obtaining a hard copy of this resource. We just call it the RMPP for short, but it's got um, the exposure scenarios, the name, the common names of the products, and as Amy was saying earlier, um, the product can be named something different in each state. So the way that this resource looks at things is through the active ingredient, through its scientific lens. So um, that's one fantastic resource that healthcare providers can use to help uh, prevent, recognize, and treat pesticide-related illnesses. Next slide, please, Amy. A secondary uh, document is something that was created actually in the early 2000s, and this is a competency-based um, program that's specific for medical and nursing practice and has specific skills that are outlined, different measurable um, objectives that came along with this through um, a multi-federal agency collaborative um, uh, program in the early 2000s that um, was run by the National Environmental Educational um, Fund, as well as EPA and USDA uh, and EPA as well. So in this document, which is also on our PerkMed website, it's out of print, so I can't get you a hard copy, but you're able to download it and look at the specific um, competency-based guidelines for healthcare providers related to identifying. Um, as a person on the front lines, you might have patients that come into your office that have been extensively using antimicrobial wipes or that have been mixing these different products that Amy showed us in the infographic and ha are having health-related effects from the uh, heavy usage of such products. So this guideline um, is a document that's available as well. Next slide, please, Amy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the description of one of the things that PerkMed does is to connect with national partnership organizations to uh, promote awareness of the resources and to help uh, the healthcare provider community um, learn more about how ubiquitous uh, exposure to pesticides potentially is. And so the example you see here in front of us with one of the frontline partners being the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association, uh, PerkMed partnered with them. Um, to write the topic that we're talking, write this brief article that you see here today that we're talking about what do pesticides have to do with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 and how those things are connected. And we did that in connection with the Northwest Primary Care Association, also with um, the Central Mountain Plains states and information um, from Amy and all of um, my colleagues at NPIC as well um, put this together to put it in the context of how are these two things related? What do pesticides, what in the world do pesticides have to do with, with uh, anything related to COVID? So we look forward to building additional partnerships with other primary care associations to increase the reach of the messages um, uh, to other groups across the country. Next slide, please. So I wanna just briefly touch on a couple of key resources um, that um, come out, um, these are, Show, showing on the screen now are examples from NPIC, the organization that Amy is from. And these are really great public facing, patient friendly um, inf infographic, uh, easy to understand. The example that you can see in front of you of the red and blue and white infographic about using disinfectant wipes. It's also, also I think, uh, Carmen, correct me if I'm wrong, in the 
uh, handouts box in the uh, panel here so you can download these individual PDFs that are specific to um, subducting wipes. And those are great public education, patient education type tools that could be used as people are more um, exposed and more aware of usage of these uh, disinfectants and wipes. So that's an example of some of the resources. EMPIC has a lot of other public facing information um, overview sheets that are fantastic as well. These are just some examples of disinfectant related um, fact sheets. Next slide, please, Amy. And then here are some examples too to look at at your leisure since we're coming up close to the end of our time here on this webinar. Some resources, um, a couple of which I've already mentioned here. Uh, another aim of PerkMed is to develop part, uh, partnerships to offer CME opportunities to direct to providers to be able to access this information. Um, on our website, you can find population specific resources or in the point at the point in early 2021 of also making case studies available that could be used in um, nursing and medical education in different curriculums and um, have some ideas about how those have worked effectively in the past. Um, and then there's educational materials you see, for example, in the middle of this frame on your screen now of the child lying on their side, a, a poster that we did in collaboration with um, uh, the University of Iowa regarding paraquat, paraquat, which is one of the most widely used herbicides in the world and um, informing people about um, uh, the lethality of that particular um, um, herbicide. And lastly, then we are always available for collaboration and technical assistance. So I would just encourage anyone who's on the webinar to reach out directly to myself or to Amy or through Carmen if you have any uh, collaboration or technical assistance needs that we can potentially address. Um, so last slide, Amy. Second to last slide, please. So this is again is just my contact information for Perk Med. I won't read that. Um, and since uh, and then I'll let you do the very last slide with your information, Amy. Thanks, Diana. So this is, um, you know, our hotline that is available free that if you were to provide this to someone coming into your offices, we are trained to talk with the general public, but also to professionals on a technical level. So um, it's open Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to noon Pacific time. We also are available via email or if you just want to peruse our website, in addition to the disinfectant materials we have, I mean, this is a huge website. We've We've been talking about antimicrobials for 25 years in addition to pesticides. So, so check it out. There might be something on there that you'd like to share or send to someone else, or, or maybe you could use it in your own personal lives too. And then I think we have just a couple minutes for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Diana and Amy. Um, to our audience, please type your questions on the question menu or the question option. Uh, while I go over some over some reminders. First of all, thank you all for participating today. Uh, second, we need your help to improve. So please take a moment to complete the survey that will appear after the webinar ends. We will really appreciate it. Um, again, if you are having trouble to download the slides or the handouts, feel free to send me an email and um, I'll send them to you. The webinar recording will be available within a week on our website. You can find our web address on the slide. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or our office if you have any questions or concerns. We'll be happy to be of assistance. And finally, reminding everybody to obtain CME or CE credit for this activity, you must um, enter this code, 49RATH, and you have to enter it on the website www.eeds.com. Okay, this is the activity code for today. Please write it down for your records. And again, any trouble, send me an email. Now let's see if we have any questions. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question. Let's see. 
Oh, somebody raised their hand, but there's no question. <laughs> All right. Let's wait. Well, I think that we're also almost out of time and I don't see any questions here. So if anybody has a question mm -hmm. later on, please send us an email and we'll be happy to help you answer any, any question you may have. And uh, please remember to answer the survey. And thanks to our speakers for sharing their time and knowledge with us. And thanks to all of you for participating today. Now you have completed the webinar and you may disconnect. Have a wonderful day. Bye.